And so it is my pleasure today to introduce the group to Dr. Uh, Doug Strand, who was recently promoted to Associate Professor at University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas. Uh, Dr. Strand obtained his PhD degree uh, from Baylor College of Medicine in Molecular and Cellular Biology in a lab of Dr. David Rowley, who are, is well known to many of us in the prostate cancer and benign prostate disease research field. Uh, he then moved to Vanderbilt University, where he did his postdoctoral fellowship uh, in the Department of Urology uh, with Simon Hayward, another well-known uh, researcher in the field of prostate, both uh, cancer and, and benign disease research. Uh, Dr. Strand's been very successful in obtaining funding to support his research program. Uh, he's been supported by a K01 career development award and has obtained an uh, R01 and uh, sub award from a, a BPH uh, center uh, grant and is also co-investigator on many additional R01 grants from both NIDDK as well as the NCI. So Dr. Strand has been quite prolific in the past uh, several years as he's moved his research to the area of spatial transcriptomics, which of course is an area of growing interest within our department as well. And he's been applying this to study prostate development, uh, benign prostate diseases like BPH and also prostate cancer. And he's gonna be telling us about this work today I first met Doug, uh, I think about eight years ago, when I was visiting Vanderbilt University to give a seminar and went out for lunch with Doug in his lab. And I think that was the first time I'd ever had uh, deep fried deep fried pickles, which of course were, were a delicacy. And I've been ordering them any, any chance I get ever since. Doug, I wish I'd have the chance to return the favor and take you out for some entertainment, but unfortunately we're still doing this all virtually. Uh, but I'm sure we can still learn a lot from you. And I also want to thank you in advance for agreeing to meet with me and several others within our department and broader cancer center afterwards to tell us more about your work. So I'll turn it over to you and mute and look forward to hearing what you have to tell us about. Thank you, Scott. Yeah, I wish, I wish we could do this in person. Um, Recording I, in I progress. Hope this will suffice. Um, so today I'm, I'm gonna talk about uh, a field that has been kind of uh, in turmoil in the last few years, um, the, the prostate progenitor field. So there's been a couple of um, major papers that have come out uh, in the last year or so that have kind of um, upended what we think of as prostate progenitors. And Bioinformatically, this has been tough because uh, cells that kind of look like what a prostate progenitor should be are not what they seem, and thus the uh, the doppelganger picture I have on the on the screen here of Keanu Reeves and some guy from Brazil who is not Keanu Reeves. And so today I'm going to tell you a little bit about a cell type that looks like a prostate progenitor. Um, but actually the prostate cell is adapting to a low androgen environment to um, look like the not Keanu Reeves club cell is what we're going to uh, talk about a little bit today. So I'm a, I'm a member of GoodMap, which is the Genital Urinary Development Molecular Anatomy Project, uh, and HubMap, which is uh, mainly on the adult side. And so um, specifically for GoodMap purposes, You'll be seeing some um, DOIs throughout the, the talk. Um, and you'll be able to, if you ever uh, wanted to um, uh, go to the raw data, we are now in an era of open science here. So we try to download all of our data, raw and processed, onto these good map websites. So you'll see these links on my slides throughout. Um, so my laboratory is interested mainly in benign disease. Uh, we are focused on benign prosthetic hyperplasia. And then secondary to that, you get detrusor dysfunction. So as you get obstruction of the bladder over time, you also get, uh, by the prostate, you also get detrusor dysfunction. So our goal is to understand all of the cell types that are in this lower urinary tract, including bladder, ureter, prostate, 
um, et cetera. And so by understanding uh, the whole picture, we might be able to develop new therapies, which honestly haven't improved in, in four decades. So BPH is age-related and progressive. You'll see on the left-hand side, uh, as a man passes the age of 40 or 45, you can see that the histological incidence of BPH inc increases quite dramatically, about 10% per decade of life. And the subsequent lower urinary tract symptoms due to this obstruction um, lag slightly behind that. And as you'll see on the right, you have uh, a fresh piece of tissue, a transverse uh, section of prostate. You see the urethra in the middle here. Um, from an 18 year old, we collect organs from young organ donors through a local transplant alliance. Um, and then we also have these specimens that are diseased. And you can see even at the gross level here, the swelling of the area around the transition zone of the prostate, uh, which is known as benign prostatic hyperplasia. This is what obstructs the, the bladder and causes lower urinary tract symptoms over time. The predominant way that clinicians treat this uh, first line treatment is an alpha blocker like doxazosin, which relaxes the smooth muscle. You can see from all the pink in this prostate that there's a lot of smooth muscle all along the lower urinary tract. This is not targeting the cause of lower urinary tract symptoms, but it does provide symptomatic relief. So it typically works on, on most patients. Um, and then finasteride uh, as a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor is also given to men whose prostate gets a little above 40, 50 grams. Um, and it's the only therapy that's available for shrinking prostate volume and lowering the progression, uh, as you can see here, bending the curve of Lutz progression as was shown in this MTOPS trial that was done at UT Southwestern um, in the early 2000s. Uh, where they tested this over a period of, of five years. Um, and, and combination therapy with both of these does bend that curve even further and slow the progression. But it's notable that this progression does not stop uh, with any of these therapies. Let's see if I can get my slide to advance. All right, so this is a nano CT of a normal human prostate. And what this shows you is uh, the pink in the middle is the urethra. Um, the, the green, uh, I'll pause this here. The green are the ducts that come out of the, the bottom of the urethra. The yellow is the seminal vesicle um, ejaculatory ducts that come into the vera montanum. Um, and what we're gonna talk about today is the cell types that are in this urethra and these proximal ducts. And how they do or do not relate to prostate disease. So I'm going to go through four different projects. Uh, the the first projects are published. I'm not going to go into them in great detail. As you can see from these links, these all the raw data are available on the GoodMap website. Um, and it, and the great thing about the GoodMap website is that it has all different types of data. So all the backup images that we didn't even put in the paper, et cetera, are all in a collection uh, um, associated with this link. So in this first project, this was from 2018, we identified novel cell types in the prostatic urethra. And this is gonna become important, understanding what these cell types are uh, and what they're not is going to become important for some of the projects that I'm gonna to talk to you about towards the end, where we're seeing that prostate luminal cells are actually adapting to a low androgen environment by masquerading as a cell type in the prostatic urethra. And I'll go through some other projects as well uh, where we're using single cell technologies to identify the different cell types in the normal and diseased uh, prostate. So all of this started um, back in 2018 when we started to collect um, lower urinary tracts from young organ donors in collaboration with the local transplant group. And we, we started to dissect the prostate into different known uh, zones like transition zone and peripheral zone to see if there were actually different cell types in these different zones that could explain the pathological observation 
that BPH occurred in the transition zone and prostate cancer is mainly in this peripheral zone? Is it due to different cell types? Um, so when we did our first, uh, tried to identify the, the cell clusters in our single cell data, what we noticed is two extra cell clusters that we had never seen before in the prostate and we, we couldn't identify. And so this was a time when, you know, back in 2017, 18, when single cell data sets were really starting, starting to explode. But uh, lucky for us, a lung data set already existed that was in nature. And what we found, long story short, is that these other epithelial cell types that we were finding that were specifically enriched in the, the, um, the uh, central and transition zone sections that we had taken from the, the normal prostate were very, very similar to what was shown in the trachea of the lung. And so hillock and club cells are known or are named uh, by lung biologists. So these hillocks are keratin-13 positive cell types that form a little bit of a mound of cells, thus the name hillock. And then these club cells um, are a secretory cell type that fights infection, uh, uh, inflammation, et cetera. So they're, they're kind of a protective cell type that's in the, the proximal part of the lung, the trachea, um, and these can be uh, progenitors for distal uh, alveolar cells as well. And so this is why we went ahead and named our cells, which we found were specifically in the prostatic urethra as club and hillock. And this is a image of a whole 18 year old uh, human prostate. And you can see a prostate luminal marker, prostatic acid phosphatase in red and keratin-13, which is our hillock cell type in white. And you can see that these ducts extend out into uh, the prostate and there's a slow transition here from these prostatic urethral cell types to the uh, prostatic acid phosphatase positive uh, or NKX 3.1 positive um, prostate luminal cells. And so um, this was the first time that the transition zone of the prostate is more defined based on cell type. Uh, again, this transition from these hillock and club prostatic urethral cells to the NKX 3.1 positive um, uh, prostate cell. And so the next study I wanted to go over is uh, something that was just published in um, the Journal of Pathology. And it's using this normal atlas that we had created in 2018 to try to understand what was happening um, in, in disease in human BPH. And so this is what we normally see. So I, I've collected almost 700 of these specimens from our urologists in the last seven years here at UT Southwestern. And every single specimen looks a little bit different. And so this is a 10 centimeter dish. This is a guy who had a 250 gram prostate and it's almost ex exclusively glandular tissue. And then you have another guy here with about 150 gram prostate who has exclusively stromal tissue. And I'll show you in a second that these are all fibroblasts. Um, and then you have men with these uh, mixed phenotypes as well. So when we, as a, as a urologist, when you treat a patient with either an alpha blocker or a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor, you don't know what the tissue composition is. And so this is, you know, we see these trends over time as an average response to these drugs, but every individual patient is responding very differently. So the goal of my lab is to actually provide more personalized treatment for this disease by being able to identify what the tissue composition is. So we wanted to know what stromal cell types are in each of these phenotypes, and might this allow us to start to treat these patients a little bit differently? Um, so we took data from our normal uh, young patients, and we subclustered the fibroblast and smooth muscle to see if there were actually subtypes of cells within 
these uh, major uh, major types, fibroblasts and smooth muscle. And we did see that there were two main types of fibroblasts, periepithelial and interstitial. I'll describe what those look like in a second. And then we also have vascular smooth muscle, prostate smooth muscle, and parasites, which are all forms of uh, smooth muscle and the prostate. So we used RNA scope, uh, finding antibodies for differentially expressed genes, sometimes problematic. So we, we turned to RNA scope, and this has been really useful for us um, over the last several years, trying to identify these cell types in situ based on the differentially expressed genes that um, we found from our single cell data. So periepithelial fibroblasts are kind of interesting. You, you can actually see them all along the urethra itself, uh, in the, around the ejaculatory ducts um, and the proximal prostate ducts of so the transition zone and central zone, um, as well as around each gland in the peripheral zone. And then the interstitial fibroblast is pretty similar where you see that these cell types are not right adjacent to any epithelium, but they're out in the interstitial space of all zones of the, the prostate. But what's interesting is that if you just look at a pan fibroblast marker like Decorin, and you look at the whole prostate uh, by itself, first of all, with uh, Desmond, you can see all of the smooth muscle. Uh, this is why alpha blockers work well, because that's the target. Um, but you see a ring of uh, dense fibroblasts around the urethra itself. And um, that's actually quite different from what you'll see in the mouse. And this is important because if we're ever going to test the mechanisms uh, and hypotheses that are coming out of the human data that we're producing, we really need uh, mouse models to, um, to, to test those. And so one of the things that we found that was interesting is that these interstitial fibroblasts are what are dramatically changing in human BPH. And so we did single cell sequencing on specific phenotypes that we could see from uh, the gross level in our tissue. Again, looking at the histology, you can see this is a pure stromal area. And what we were finding in these pure stromal areas is specifically an enrichment of these C7 uh, interstitial fibroblasts. And then even in the glandular nodules, the other major phenotype in human BPH, you could see that interstitial fibroblasts were, um, were expanding around the, the glandular nodules as well. So this definitely seems to be a cell type that likely has an important biological function in um, the progression and growth of the uh, prostate and its associated lower urinary tract symptoms. Well, what else was interesting is that we could now get a objective view of all of the different leukocytes that were uh, in these BPH specimens as well. Now, this was a major problem for the uh, prostate field. For a long time, we always thought that it was mainly macrophages and T cells, but because of all of these really, really good, well annotated single cell data sets that were coming out and um, some of these other organs, we were able to use those as a reference and find that uh, most of what we thought were macrophages are actually dendritic cells. And this kind of changes our mindset about the disease pathogenesis um, and suggests that there might be some autoimmunity uh, that is driving this. Remember that the prostate's the only organ that develops after puberty, right? And so some of the proteins that are expressed look like autoantigens and might be um, driving uh, an inflammatory phenotype that could be driving growth, resistance to therapies, et cetera. And so it's important for us to think holistically about the, all of the different cell types that are involved and how they're interacting with each other. And that's where we turned to uh, using some of these receptor ligand interactions. So now we have a transcriptional profile of every cell type uh, in this disease, in both normal and disease. And we can test the specific 
strengths of interactions between uh, specific receptors and ligands in each cell type. And this is kind of an example of that where you see you can look at something like uh, CSF1 and SERPA interactions between interstitial fibroblasts um, and um, periepithelial fibroblasts with myeloid cells, right? And so those are kind of those are the kind of mechanisms that you can start to uh, test in um, e even in in human data sets. So Simon Hayward, my my postdoc mentor has been looking through databases out of um, the hospital system in Chicago and found that patients who were treated with um, TNF-alpha inhibitors for autoimmune diseases like uh, rheumatoid arthritis actually have decreased levels of BPH LUTs. So this is kind of how we can, you know, we can use these, these human um, databases to test these hypotheses, but also we're going to need mouse models eventually to test these uh, hypotheses as well. But this is kind of a, a caricature of, of some of the interactions that are we found were changed in our human BPH specimens. So uh, genes like CCL2 were going up in epithelial cells. We know that CCL2 signals to myeloid cells. Uh, Interstitial fibroblasts were increasing CXCL13, which is a specific re recruiter of B cells, et cetera, et cetera. Now we can start to come up with specific hypotheses about how this disease is progressing. Again, we, we're going to need mouse models in order to um, test these hypotheses. So we also did uh, created an atlas of the mouse prostate. And again, um, the 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 uh, mouse lower urinary tract is anatomically a little bit different from the human. You see bladder, urethra, and then these proximal and, and distal regions of these three different uh, or four different prostate lobes. And what we're able to find is that there are three discrete types of fibroblasts in the prostate uh, and urethra. Uh, a ductal fibroblast that is I'll show you in a second, is mainly found in this proximal area, um, these, these ducts that connect the prostate to the urethra, uh, a C3 positive uh, prostate fibroblast that is mainly just in these distal regions of each of the lobes of the prostate, and then there's a urethral fibroblast that is LGR5 positive. Um, again, we find all of these differentially expressed genes um, that are selectively expressed in these. And then we try to um, do a correlation analysis of the cell types in mouse and human in order to get a good sense of which cell type we should try to target as we make these mouse models going forward. Um, again, you know, in human, we saw that interstitial fibroblasts are increased. So can we find an interstitial-like fibroblast in the mouse that eventually we can model certain um, things off of? So again, this is kind of hard to see, uh, but what we found is that the C3 prostate fibroblast is mainly out in the, the prostate itself. Um, these LGR5 positive fibroblasts, so this is the bladder and this is the urethra. You can kind of see that along the, the bladder neck here in the urethra, um, is the concentration of these LGR fibroblasts. And this is important because when people, so when people dissect the prostate, you, sometimes you're not going to do it cleanly, right? And there's no pure population in these different dissections. So if you're doing single cell, you need to have a good reference of what these cell types are because you're going to see small population of urethral fibroblasts, even in this proximal region, right? So this is kind of the importance of understanding the um, discrete cell types, because some people are, are confusing um, some of these cell types with uh, maybe like they're confusing an LGR5 positive uh, cell type as because they're only selecting the proximal area of the prostate when they dissect. But really, that's a urethral fibroblast that just uh, extends into this proximal region a little bit. 
So the, the next project I want to tell you about sets up the last one, which is unpublished. So we were able to um, identify a urethral cell type that everybody else had said was a stem cell in the proximal area of the prostate. But by understanding the anatomy, we can see that it's just a urethral cell type that extends into the proximal area uh, of the, the prostate. So this whole field was started off um, back in the 60s with Don Coffey and John Isaacs, where they showed that you could castrate an animal, the prostate would shrink, and you could give back androgens and it would grow back to its original size. And you could do this 30 times in a row. Um, and then about a decade or two later, there came out a, a series of publications from Lynn Wilson's lab that showed that if you just dissect different areas of the lower urinary tract, so the, the urethra itself, the proximal area, and these intermediate and distal areas of the, the branching prostate, and you embed that tissue in a kidney capsule and let it grow, what you'll see is that the distal areas of the prostate actually don't regenerate prostate very well but the proximal area and the urethra itself do. And that was this, that gave birth to this idea that there were stem cells in this proximal area. But everybody always talks about this proximal area and they don't talk about the fact that the urethra did just as well. So is the urethra a reservoir of stem cells for the prostate uh, as well? Everybody kind of ignored that and just focused on the fact that these were enriched in the proximal area. And in fact, if you dissect, Lee Shin did this uh, experiment where if you dissect the, a prostate lobe into a proximal, middle, and distal regions, there's actually a, a group of cells that can be defined by high STAL1 expression that are enriched in these proximal areas. And if you do uh, pot multipotency assays with these ex vivo, you can see that they can differentiate into different cell types. Also, if you castrate an animal, you'll also, also see an enrichment of uh, this cell type that is normally enriched in the proximal area. It all pointed to the uh, cool idea that you were actually getting uh, proliferation from a proximal niche of stem cells after regeneration that could repopulate the prostate. However, in the last year or two, there's been a couple of papers, one from Charles Sawyer's lab and also actually one from Li Shin's lab that showed that the cells of the proximal area of the prostate and the distal area of the prostate do not necessarily overlap. And so when you castrate a mouse and you regenerate it, this is an experiment where they're using a confetti reporter to show clonal expansion after you regenerate it with androgens. And they show that there was no proximal um, source of cells that were regenerating distal prostate tissue. And Li Shin's lab used a SCAL1 uh, reporter mouse to show the exact same thing, that when you regenerate cells of the proximal area, only repopulate cells in that area, cells of the distal prostate, uh, specifically NKX 3.1 positive cells of the distal prostate are the ones that regenerate when you give back androgens. And we wanted to come up with some sort of explanation for this. So we did single cell sequencing uh, to create an atlas of the epithelia of the prostate and urethra as well. Again, we dissected the lower urinary tract here um, into different anatomical regions and what was interesting is when we did, when we looked at the different populations, we could see that when you just look in the prostate, you can see this cluster of cells that are keratin-4 positive and PSCA positive and uh, SCA1 positive. There is a small population of these, just like everybody else was seeing by flow cytometry. The difference is that we also did the urethra. And this is the exact same population of cells that's in the urethra as well. Um, and when you look at a differentially expressed gene or anchor gene, whatever you want to call it, like keratin-4, you can see that it, the keratin-4 is 
um, expressed inside the urethra itself, and that you just get an extension of these keratin-4 cells into the proximal area of the prostate. So if you would have dissected out here, you wouldn't have seen these cells. But if you dissect it right at the boundary here uh, at the rhabdo sphincter that surrounds the urethra of the mouse, you'll actually see a population of these cells. But you just have to understand the anatomical context of, of these cells. And yes, these cells are actually castration resistant, but that's because they're urethral cells and they don't express androgen receptor. Um, this kind of redefines the, the transition zone of the mouse as well. So again, you'll see this keratin-4 positive cell uh, in these proximal parts of prostate ducts and an immediate transition to NKX 3.1 positive cells um, of the, the prostate itself. What was really interesting is that if you went back and looked at all the papers that had been produced on this, uh, this proximal cell type that was proposed to be a stem cell based on these facultative spheroid assays ex vivo, you could see that they all express the same markers, keratin 19, keratin 4, Li6D, PSCA, a whole series of papers had used uh, genes like SCAL1, which is Li6 DNA, uh, trope 2, even CD133 is mainly enriched in seminal vesicle. So if you just, you know, take a preparation of, of all of these, uh, all of this tissue and plate these cells ex vivo, you're going to see survival of these other cell types. Uh, that does not necessarily mean that those are progenitors for the prostate. So we wanted to look at this possibility in BPH. Long time ago, pe people have been talking about BPH as a stem cell disease for a really long time. So are these cell types enriched? So in the normal prostate, you'll see these club and hillock cells of the prostatic urethra are, are pretty rare and specifically localized to the prostatic urethra, not out in the prostate. Um, and then in BPH, what we were seeing is that you're getting this huge increase in club cells. And even when you did uh, PSCA flow cytometry, you could also see these. PSCA is a marker of these hillock and, and club cells of the prostatic urethra. Um, and so we thought, oh, well, maybe there is a, a stem cell that's increasing in, in BPH. Let's look in situ at these. So this is what a club and hillock cell look like in the prostatic urethra. Hillock cells are kind of a, a basal-like um, cell and these club cells are found interspersed um, with these hillock cells, but you never really see these cells out in the prostate itself. And then in, in rare occasions, we could see some of these clubs, what look like club cells based on SCGB 1A1, secreted globin 1A1 expression, but they don't morphologically look like club cells. And that was kind of confusing to us, but we just kind of ignored it because we couldn't really explain it. Then when we looked at patients who were treated with a 5-ARI, we were seeing huge swaths of these areas that had secreted globin 1A1 or 3A1, whatever the marker was, expression. And we thought, oh, this is really cool because you're actually seeing maybe this stem cell that is uh, increasing after 5-ARI treatment or that is surviving the 5-ARI treatment. Um, and it's specifically the, the cell of this prostatic urethra. But then we thought about it a little bit more. We thought, well, we never see this many club cells in normal BPH. You're only seeing this after 5-ARI treatment. Is this really a club cell or is this just a, a pretender? Um, sort of like this Brazilian guy. So that's where we get to the final project here. And, and this is all unpublished. So what we're seeing is that you're actually getting a club-like adaptation of luminal cells during 5-ARI treatment. Um, and interestingly, it, it seems to be blocked in, in glandular nodules. So this is kind of a cool story I thought I'd throw in here because it's specific to UT Southwestern. There's, there's actually quite a long history of 5-ARIs at UT Southwestern. So um, the late Gene Wilson, who actually just uh, passed away recently, 
was the first one to discover that DHT is a testosterone metabolite. This was back in 1968. And this is a photo that was actually taken by the chair of my department, um, Klaus Warborn. And there's a really nice uh, paper, Gene Wilson and his legacy in, uh, in urology that just came out if you wanna uh, read up on, on the story of these discoveries. Um, in 1974 and five, a guy named Patrick Walls here at UT, South, UT Southwestern actually discovered the basis of pseudo hermaphroditism uh, is due to decreased DHT levels. And this was published in the New England Journal um, back in the, the mid seventies. Even without knowing uh, that these were, uh, this was linked to SRD5A2, Merck was developing finasteride and, and within a few years, dutasteride um, to try to target these 5-alpha reductase um, genes, the, the, these enzymes that change, uh, metabolize testosterone to DHT. At the same time, uh, Dr. Russell, who actually was our um, dean of research and actually just retired uh, th this last month, he was the first one in 1991 to clone the the 5-alpha reductase 2 gene, SOD5A2, and showed that its deletion is the cause of pseudohermaphroditism. So imagine, you know, they actually did this study down in the Caribbean where they showed that these um, XY males were phenotypically female up until puberty. And then with this, uh, there was a surge of testosterone at puberty and they masculinized. Uh, this is a very Catholic area too. So these people are really, really ostracized. Uh, it's, a, it's a horrible um, uh, thing to have to go through. So in 1992 and uh, to 2010, there were a number of clinical trials in collaboration with Merck on finasteride and dutasteride. Um, actually, even in 1991, they were doing single year studies. And then uh, later on, they were doing these multi-year studies, uh, the MTOPS and combat trials with these different 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, sometimes in combination with um, alpha blockers. And again, this was done by people at UT Southwestern. The former chair, Dr. McConnell, and the current chair, Dr. Warborn, were all the ones that, that led this. Um, I, I thought I'd throw that in there. I think it's kind of a cool uh, legacy of UT Southwestern and it kind of sets up this last project where we're specifically interested in why certain patients respond to a 5-ARI and some don't. And so on the left-hand side, you'll see an untreated man with BPH. You can see very glandular histology, lots of nodules. Um, and on the right-hand side, there's a man who was treated with a 5-ARI, um, obviously still underwent a simple prostatectomy, uh, but you can see specific areas of atrophy uh, in this man. And then you can also see these nodular areas where there is no response. And this is kind of what it looks like in higher power. You can see these atrophied glands. This is, the, this is why the prostate shrinks about 20% when you put a man on a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. It's because these glands are shrinking. So we decided to use spatial transcriptomics to get at this issue of why certain glands are responding and some aren't. If we try to do this with single cell uh, digesting the tissue, you can't really see exactly what you're trying to carve out and do single cell on. So this is really a great way to uh, get a transcriptional signature and link it to the phenotype that you're seeing. So this is the 10X Genomics Visium platform. Uh, with these, you have to use, uh, well, when we did this, you had to use frozen tissue. Uh, they have a new platform now where you can um, do FFPE tissue. But what you can see is we selected specific areas that were non-responsive and responsive to a 5-ARI, and we put them on this grid so what you have in this Visium platform is a grid of about 5,000 capture areas or dots on this grid that are equally spaced. And um, you can capture the, the transcriptome from that specific area. And 
this is not at the sing a single cell resolution. And so when we try to annotate each of these dots as a specific cell type, based on our, our single cell differentially expressed genes, you'll see that we had to sum uh, these and create a probability score. So when a dot is annotated as a prostate luminal cell, it may not be only a prostate luminal cell, but that is uh, on average, the highest expression is the prostate luminal cell. So I hope you can understand exactly what I mean when I say we're assigning a probability score to um, each of the dots on this grid. The first thing we had to do actually is make sure that these patients were actually on a 5-ARI. The clinical records can sometimes be inaccurate. We wanted to be absolutely positive that these guys were um, on a 5-ARI at the time of surgery. And uh, so we sent samples to uh, Jim Moeller's core at Roswell Park and they measure DHT, testosterone, and either dutasteride or finasteride to make sure that there was drug in the tissue, that DHT levels were low. And what you see, of course, with these five ARIs is that there's a backup in the pathway. So you're going to see increased testosterone uh, levels in these patients as well. So what we notice is that if you look at tissue from a man who's untreated, you'll see that all of the luminal cells identify as prostate luminal cells. But in a 5 ARI five treated man, what we were seeing is the emergence of heterogeneity where we we're seeing a lot of these dots or capture areas on this grid were starting to identify as club cells. And so we wanted to look at that a little bit deeper and we wanted to see the spectrum of expression. So this is a, a heat map of a club score in these 5-ARI treated tissues. So you can see that there's kind of a spectrum here. Some of them are really, really strongly identifying as a club cell, and some of them are kind of intermediate. And in the, for the prostate luminal score, score, you'll see it's maximal in these untreated men, and then you'll see a little bit of variation in uh, these, these treated men. If you take and subset just the prostate luminal and club dots from these grids, and you put them on axes of probability score for club or prostate luminal, what was interesting, first of all, is that we could confirm that in the untreated man, you only saw cells that were really highly probable prostate luminal cells. But in the 5-ARI treated, we were actually seeing a spectrum of prostate luminal to club probabilities from all of these luminal cells. And I, I think, you know, just to explain this a little bit further, you see this is a one, which is the maximal sum probability that this one particular dot was a pure club cell. And, um, and this only had, you know, this was probably 90% club cell and 10% prostate luminal cell. And so we're identifying this mainly as a, as a, um, club cell, but this is, this is a spectrum here. What was interesting is that if you did the same thing against HILOC cells, we were not seeing this spectrum. So this is specifically looks like a transition from a prostate luminal cell to a club cell, not to any other cell type. And we also did not see this spectrum with basal cells either. So what we decided to do is try to link the histology to the transcriptional profile. And so we created four different bins of this uh, of these club and luminal cells along this spectrum. Uh, prostate luminal, you know, most likely prostate luminal here, and then an intermediate luminal, most likely club and an intermediate club. And then we replotted uh, these um, identities on this grid. And what was really interesting is that you could actually do morphological studies and show that the strength of luminal phenotype or transcriptional identity was associated with the size and shape of the glands themselves. And so we did a number of different uh, estimation, morphological estimations, gland area, circularity, height, uh, et cetera, 
and we're able to link each of those bins of transcriptional spectrum between club and luminal to a morphology in the tissue. What was really interesting, though, is that we wanted to, in order to say that this is a, a transition that's happening, we wanted to be able to show that there's co-expression of luminal and club genes in the same cell type in a, in a gland that's kind of intermediate. So first of all, if you look at androgen regulated genes like MSMB, PSA, NKX3.1, you can see that even the luminal cells in 5-ARI treated compared to luminal cells in untreated have lower levels of these um, uh, androgen regulated genes. And then you can see a gradual decrease in these androgen regulated genes in these different bins to the club-like. But if you look in situ, uh, gene, club genes like LTF or PIGR, in the untreated, you never see these expressed in prostate glands that are NKX3.1 positive. But there are some glands that are intermediate shaped in 5-ARI treated where you can see co-expression of these club genes and NKX3.1. And then if you look at just the atrophy, the fully atrophied glands in those patients, you'll see that NKX3.1 is almost gone and it's mainly these club genes. Now, are those actually club cells now? Uh, bioinformatically, it will tell you that they are. That's what we see in our single cell data. That's what actually a lot of people are seeing in their prostate cancer data sets in these men that are treated with ADT. You'll see the exact same thing where you, you think that you're getting this huge population of club cells, when in all likelihood, those were normal cells in the tissue that had adapted to a club-like state um, because of the low androgen levels. The other interesting thing is that we were able to show that um, NF-kappa B and anti-apoptosis targets were also increased according to this morphological and transcriptional progression to club-like state. So um, from the Visium data, you can see as you progress to a club-like state, you have a higher NF-kappa B target score. We can, sh we can show it in situ uh, with a phospho-NF-kappa B antibody. And the same with um, BCL2. You can see a gradual increase in, um, in BCL2 as, as well as other anti-apoptosis targets uh, according to this transition. Um, we're even able to take primary prostate epithelial cells treat them with TNF-alpha and show that you could induce these genes ex vivo in culture as well, which I thought was pretty interesting. Um, if you just look at the normal prostate, so these are cells from a young organ donor specimen. If you look at club cells and prostate luminal cells, you can see just naturally the prostatic urethra has a higher level of NF-kappa B and BCL2 um, at baseline. And so we have this, this transition, we think 5-ARIs are inducing where you're getting increased NF-kappa B signaling, decreased AR signaling with the treatment of a 5-ARI uh, until the gland gets really, really small and is almost NKX3.1 positive, um, but uh, NKX3.1 negative but positive for all of these club markers. And the experimental evidence for this actually was produced by the Sawyer's lab last year. So they showed in a uh, very expensive <laughs> single cell experiment where they did single cell sequencing of intact um, prostate, and then after castration at one day, seven, 14, 28, and then get, giving androgens back one day, three days, seven days, 14 and 28. And they showed the transition of prostate luminal cells. Um, as you can see, the, these are the, the L2 cells, which is the, the prostatic urethral cell in the mouse. Um, you can see that these two groups of cells start to look like each other after 28 days of castration. And then when you give back androgens, those cells uh, populations start to 
separate again. And um, what they showed with the lineage tracing is that that's not because you're actually getting the urethral cells that are expanding to distal prostate, but it's because the prostate luminal cells themselves go into this sort of hibernation mode where they're looking like a prostatic urethral cell until androgens come back and they can differentiate again. It's really uh, an interesting phenomenon. They're also able to show in that paper that if you look at patients, prostate cancer patients that are treated with ADT or um, untreated and do single cell, you actually see in this fate map on the bottom here that there is a switch to a club-like signature but only in the cells that are non-cancerous. So they did copy number variation analysis of all of their single cell data from these humans. They pulled out all of the cells that had high copy number and then did this analysis. Um, so I don't think that you're gonna see this signature come up very strongly in tumor cells for whatever reason, I, I can't explain that yet. It looks like it might just be normal cells that are adapting like this. Um, but there's a lot of work still to do to, to figure that out. So I want to finish up here uh, talking about the clinical implications of 5-ARI resistance. So one of the interesting things that we found here is that a lot of the glands that were not responding with a club-like adaptation were found inside nodules. And so we wanted to make sure that this wasn't a drug penetration issue, which is basically the first question everybody always asks. Well, are you, you know, is the drug just not getting into these nodules and that's why you're not getting this response? And long story short, what we found using mass spec is that, yes, the drug actually is getting into the tissue. You, you actually do see some nodules that respond to this. Uh, and you, when we look at these different areas of internodular and nodular, it's the, the drug is, and the DHT levels are uniform. So that's not what it is. Um, when we went back to our spatial data uh, from Visium and looked at one of the patients that had a nodule and compared it to an the luminal cells from an untreated patient, we actually do see some of these um, genes that are uh, club-like that are going up inside the nodule. So even though it's phenotypically still an NKX 3.1 positive luminal cell, you're starting to see this expression I can't explain to you why it's not fully undergoing atrophy other than maybe um, the testosterone levels that go up with DH uh, with 5-ARI treatment might be driving this. I, I can't really explain why that's happening. Maybe it's a density thing where once the glands get close enough to each other, they somehow become resistant to the lower DHT. We're still trying to look into that. So, Finally, I wanted to show you uh, a piece of data that I, I wish was complete, but is not. But we wanted to get at these questions, how different are real club cells in the urethra from club-like prostate luminal cells in these 5-ARI-treated men? And how different are these 5-ARI-resistant luminal cells from normal ones uh, in, in untreated men? So we have been using the nanostring platform uh, this is a really, really powerful platform, I think, for using all of those archived blocks that you have sitting in your pathology department um, that are all clinically annotated and phenotypically annotated. Uh, and if they were fixed well, you can do RNA scope on these for up to three different markers in a fairly large slide and get segmented cell type specific transcriptional profiles. And I'll, I'll show you how this kind of works here. So here's a, a one by three slide of BPH where we're seeing um, this responsive area to a 5-ARI and a resistant area of 5-ARI. Um, so this is NKX 3.1 expression and secrete globin 3A1 expression. And we can capture these specific areas of um, prostate luminal only cells. So you can segment just the NKX 3.1 positive cells and it's a photocleavable oligo system. So when UV light shines, um, you can capture 
RNA transcripts just from the NKX 3.1 positive cells. And you can do that for up to three different markers from the same region of interest. And you can do up to 12 regions of interest per slide. I like this because you can also capture a larger area versus the Visium where it's a fairly small um, grid. And this is uh, the sensitivity I really like about this too. So if we wanna look at real club cells that are only in the prostatic urethra from this large FFPE slide, we can actually capture as few as um, 25 of these club cells in the prostatic urethra and are able to get detectable expression from this, uh, which I think is extremely uh, sensitive and, and powerful. Um, you know, the data from this eventually will be, again, comparing a urethral club to a 5-ARI luminal to uh, untreated luminal, and hopefully we'll be able to see this progression, see the specific differences between a real club cell and, and this uh, Keanu Reeves lookalike club uh, luminal cell uh, versus this untreated luminal cell inside nodules, et cetera. This is the way we're kind of approaching, um, looking at trying to get transcriptional profiles of these different phenotypes. We're also trying to, for the urologists in the group, we're trying to find non-invasive clinical predictors of 5-ARI response too. This isn't a drug that you want to put everybody on if, if they aren't going to benefit from it because there are side effects. And so we just published a paper where we can actually link uh, MRI signature to the histological composition. Understanding the histological composition may guide your decision to put a patient on a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. And then we're also looking at things like PSA density, um, you know, if you have a high PSA density, it's probably cancer or inflammation. If you have a low PSA density, what we're showing is that that's histologically indicative of um, higher probability of stromal composition, which again, you wouldn't want to put a patient on a 5-ARI if they have stromal composition. You probably wouldn't even want to put them on an alpha blocker because uh, stromal is all fibroblasts and we still have yet to treat the real um, problem in BPH, which is the, the fibroblasts. Um, so I told you about the identification of these novel cell types in the prostatic urethra, that these fibroblasts expand. Looking forward, we want to develop these non-invasive predictors of failure, you know, look at novel therapeutics that target the causes, not the symptoms, maybe develop uh, this idea of using autoimmune therapies. Um, and of course, we're going to have to develop these mouse models to test the mechanisms that are coming out of this human data. And then finally, we want to use spatial transcriptomics to look to sort of catch BPH in the act. This is a disease of branching morphogenesis. You can even see uh, what happens is you get a, a stromal nodule and then you get branching into that nodule. Can we use spatial to specifically target those branching areas and figure out some, some mechanisms? Um, I just want to thank the people in the lab that did all this work. Uh, Dia is a postdoc. She did most of the uh, second two projects. Um, Gervais has now left us for industry, but did all the bioinformatics for this. And then, of course, um, working with the, the surgeons in our department has been a, a pleasure as well. So um, I'm sorry I went over a little time, but uh, I appreciate the, the uh, attention and I'll, I'll take any questions. Thanks a lot, Doug. That was, that was absolutely outstanding. If you have a question, please just turn on your video and unmute. I see that Leo, our department chair, has a question. Go ahead, Leo. Thank you, Dr. Strand. This was a tour de force, uh, extremely impressive uh, work, um, and it warms the hearts of every pathologist to see so many histology slides in yeah. such an ele elegant presentation. Just a note of history for to put in your history books. Um, Don Gleason, the uh, creator of the Gleason scoring um, system for prostate uh, cancer, was actually a faculty member in our department for many years, worked at the VA, and um, I was fortunate to get to know him a little bit uh, before he passed. And so there's a, a nice long history of interest. One of the, and I was, and I was very pleased to see your last comments on, uh, on, the, on the 
fiberglass, whatever, many decades ago, some colleagues and I from the VA published a paper showing uh, very high levels of TGF beta um, localized in the uh, fibroblast stream of cells in the prostate. So, so much of the pathology, I mean, your studies are absolutely uh, We see so many fibroblasts, and that's such a bulk of the contributor to DPH. Um, I'm wondering, and also uh, inflammation slash chronic inflammation also wounds the parts pathologist because it's at, at the genesis of so much pathology we see in so many different organs. Uh, I wonder what uh, you or the field knows about the role of the drivers for this uh, sort of massive uh, fibroblast uh, proliferation. Yeah, I, I think that's the key question um, to the whole etiology of the disease. That last picture I showed you this is all C7 fibroblasts in here. And this is the first thing that happens in a young man. You get stromal nodules around the urethra and the, the glands branch into those stromal nodules and become glandular nodules. So if we want to figure out how this is starting, this is how we got to approach it. We need to know about the fibroblasts that are inducing this branching. Interesting. Now, do you think we'll be able to use the mouse to study that or no? I, I think we can't right now, but we could if we figured out the mechanisms in the human. Yeah. I think we just haven't found the mechanisms yet. Fair enough. Thank you. Andy, did you have a question? Oh, I think he's... Yes, I do. Thank you. I just had to find my, my clicker to get myself off of mute. Doug, thanks. That was a, a really cool talk. And I'm actually a, a pathologist researcher as well and, and have like several others in our department been trying to play with some of these spatial technologies. So really, really cool data. Um, I actually have kind of two technical questions, but one scientific question that I, I think is more interesting first, which is based on the story you told about the club cells and the responsiveness, is that a cell type or is that a state of mind? I mean, is that, and, and you know, I think about this a lot when we, we talk about epithelial to mesenchymal transition, mesenchymal right. to epithelial transition as cells become invasive versus proliferative. And I just, I'm kind of wondering from, from your standpoint is, is kind of thinking from the development side of things. Is yeah. So, so we showed a few years ago, if you look during development, those club and, Hillock cells of the prostatic urethra are there before the prostate buds off of the prostatic urethra. But there, there is an argument that they are not the progenitors for NKX 3.1 positive cells. Um, I think it's more from a basal cell that you're getting actual uh, prostate differentiation. Okay. Um, and we, you know, certainly the obvious thing you would think, which is what we thought at first, is that when you see a secreted globin positive cell, it's a club cell that survived, not necessarily a luminal cell that adapted. I think the argument against that is that you never see this many club cells in BPH. And morphologically, they look very different from club cells in the prostatic urethra. And also you see a spectrum. If I was seeing this, you know, sort of binarily, uh, I, where you're just seeing the, you know, all of these club or club like cells with a pure signature that's different from the prostate luminals. I would say maybe that's the case that they're just surviving. But I think the fact that you're seeing this spectrum and that we can actually detect double positive cells and it's linked to the morphology of the gland as well. And you're seeing a spectrum of morphologies I think it suggests that this is a true transition. Cool. So, so that kind of leads then into a little bit of a technical question with the 10x Visium. I'm, I've have no experience on that. I've just tried to write about it in grants, whereas we've run experiments on the, on the nanostring DSP with each one, with the resolution of each one of those spots, as, as you indicated, it is not close to single cell, but I forget with the 10x Visium kind of, how many cells are in one of those regions and and when you're trying to do you know kind of cell type assignment or or 
to, or as it may be, you know, understand what's going on in those regions. Do you have any kind of sense or parameters as we're also moving forward this technology? Like if you're going to say that's a club like area or aluminal like area, yeah. like what's the, what's the density of cells or the proportion of cells within that region that kind of defines it, its identity by the bioinformatics processes that you guys were using? Yeah. It's anywhere from two to 10 cells is what they say. Okay. Huh. Um, you know, this is why we're not using Visium anymore. Uh, it, it was actually great for this particular question, yeah, but yeah. we have moved exclusively to nanostring to get better cell type specific resolution. That makes me I think it's better. yeah, I, I, I makes good me for you if you're skipping it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, because I mean that that and that was kind of similarly too. And I mean the, the other thing that I've tried to struggle with, and, and you're a great person to answer this then is as I look at papers and and talk to people is is does the does the ten x visium with that spatial resolution does it still have some of the same limitations that we have with single cell, which is you get a relatively thin scrape of the transcriptome within each region, as far as the total number of unique expressed features within each region. So, like, yeah. uh, just to put it in context, like, uh, in a lot of our single cell data, you know, if we look on a cell by cell basis, I mean, we're very aware, as everyone else is, that you only get maybe five, ten percent of the total transcriptome assigned to each UMI um, from a cell basis. So, I mean, it, it like, are you just getting, is it the same thing? You're kind of getting a thin scrape of the transcriptome within each one of those regions or? Yes. The short answer is yes. It's, it's okay. not um, as deep as one would like, but again, for cell type identification, it's deep enough. Yeah, for sure. Agreed. Yeah. For great. I just trying to kind of get a technical perspective on it from someone that's actually really played with the data. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Andy. We have two more questions. Uh, I think Dr. Crossan had his video on before Dr. Morgan. So we'll let Dr. <laughs> Crossan ask the first question and Dr. Morgan can bring us home. <laughs> Sorry, Pari. Um, yeah, this is a fascinating presentation as people have said. Um, you said earlier on that the uh, club cells in the lung are involved in uh, pathogen recognition and, and protection. Uh, I'm assuming that they are also involved in the prostate, if, and, and if that is correct, um, what, what's the mechanism for the protection of club cells protecting against pathogen invasion? Yeah, I, th I think it's all in the, the anatomy. The prostatic urethra is the mucosal barrier for the prostate. Mm -hmm. And it has the tools, the cell types with the right functions to protect the prostate. And it's actually something that my postdoc is kind of interested in, interested in pursuing um, with her independent career is in the male and female, how is the urethra protecting or, or failing to protect in disease? Um, you know, the, the normal function of these mucosal barriers, as you know, um, lung, you know, all these, all these organs that are exposed to the outside right. have to have uh, the, the function in antibacterial, antiviral, anti-inflammatory. And so that's what those cells are normally doing. And, you know, honestly, maybe that's what's happening in, in these prostate luminal cells too, in order sure. to survive. They're, they're turning on this, um, uh, these same mechanisms in order to fight all these things during low androgen environments. All right, Pari, bring us home. Thank you. Um, thank you, Scott. That was a really fascinating talk. Really great work. Thank you so much for presenting it here. Um, uh, I'm Pari. I'm a urologic pathologist uh, at the university here. I just have a basic question. Um, so you mentioned clinical decision making um, might uh, uh, might benefit from um, the urologist knowing whether there is predominance of glandular hyperplasia versus uh, stromal hyperplasia, um, right? So uh, we do know that the stromal cells also have androgen receptors. So um, do you think the stromal cells respond at all to uh, ARIs or um, uh, not at all. So in the images that you showed, uh, where there was a patient with BPH and then a patient who was treated with ARIs, 
um, could one potentially argue that there was also reduction or shrinkage of the stroma in addition to the atrophy of the glands? Is there any role uh, at all that these stromal cells play? Um, and also in this picture that you're showing right here, where you said the glandular cells were proliferating into the stromal nodule, could it be because of the influence of the stromal cells and their response to androgen that these uh, cells are actually being influenced by uh, the, the stromal, uh, stromal cells actually? So yeah, also very, very good questions. Um, the, the answer is yes uh, to basically everything that you just said. Uh, <laughs> The, so Herb Lepore actually showed that when you put a patient on a, a 5-ARI, you do see response in the stromal cells as well. It's just that stromal cells aren't as addicted to DHT for their survival, uh, even though they express androgen receptor. And actually, androgen receptor goes up in stromal cells and BPH. Um, their survival isn't dependent on DHT like prostate luminal cells are. So you're not seeing as much of a response, but there is s signaling that is happening in the stroma that is being affected uh, by these uh, five ARIs, certainly. Um, so yeah, what you'll see like in this big stromal nodule here is that you'll see an increase in AR positive fibroblasts in this stromal nodule. That is likely <laughs> got to be important in the the biology of the branching that's occurring into um, this this nodule. So certainly, uh, f food for thought going forward. Okay, Thank great. You. Thank you, everybody, for your participation and questions. This was a really dynamic Zoom, and I'm really happy to see that we're able to give Doug some, some great things to think about as he heads back. Uh, I know some of you are going to be able to meet with Dr. Strand later today. Thanks, Doug, for providing us with your time for doing that. If any of you would like to meet with Dr. Strand after this seminar uh, but are not on the schedule, uh, Amy does have uh, Dr. Strand's contact information and I think would be happy to set up a brief Zoom if you'd like to extend conversation in the point over this week or something like that. So with that, we can close. Thanks again. I learned a lot. I uh, appreciate your time. And everybody have a great day. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Doug.